Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for uh, being here today. So, uh, today we're going to discuss the Brazil situation after the elections uh, and uh, to understand a little bit more about what did happen uh, during these uh, very special elections we had uh, in October and what we can expect from the new uh, Lula's government. Uh, with uh, me today, I have uh, three distinguished guests and friends, and I'm very pleased to, that uh, you all accepted. So first, uh, Sulvai Omut. She is a researcher at uh, Cicero, a specialist in uh, climate uh, policies and environmental policies, especially in Brazil. Uh, we have uh, Marcos Melo, uh, professor of political science at the University Federal, Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil. Uh, and also Diego Werneck Aguilis, that is an associate professor of law at INSPIR, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, so we uh, thought about having this uh, webinar divided in uh, three main blocks. One, the first to talk about uh, the election, the campaign period. Uh, the second to talk about the context uh, now after the elections. And uh, finally, discuss a little bit more about challenges uh, for the Lula government. Uh, I will uh, ask the each block uh, should have about 20 minutes and I will first ask the our guests like to start with their initial considerations highlighting like the main points that uh, we should uh, develop further in our uh, conversation. So I think the three blocks will uh, last about 60 minutes and then uh, I will try to have like a half an hour 20 minutes for uh, questions for the audience. Uh, with that said, uh, I will uh, uh, ask Marcus uh, Melo to start. I will follow this order. Marcus, you start first, talk about uh, four or five minutes and then uh, Diego and then Sulvai. So I can, uh, and then we can open for a more uh, uh, like uh, free discussion about uh, the main topics you are raising. Okay, so Marcus, the word is yours. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Yuri, for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure to be here, to be able to, uh, to discuss this election, which came as a surprise for many pundits and observers, uh, right? It was a very uh, tight race. The margin of victory was very slim and uh, extremely polarized and uh, with huge uh, historical uh, significance for for the future of, of Brazil. And there are lessons to, <clears throat> to be drawn in terms of uh, the resilience of democracy, of democracy in, in, in Brazil. And uh, there are lots of things that uh, we may uh, uh, address uh, in detail uh, later, which has to do with the, the, the historical uh, meaning of this significance of this uh, election, uh, uh, some uh, important, uh, uh, no anticipated uh, events, the very competitive, uh, uh, after all, uh, Bolsonaro trailed Lula by a 20 margin, 20% 20 margin for uh, almost a year. So it, it came as a surprise. And uh, in addition to the resilience, uh, there is also the issue that the, the transition was uh, peaceful in relatively uh, uneventful uh, against the backdrop of the, the expectations of uh, a, a uh, invasion of, of the capital uh, style event in, in, in Brazil. So uh, I'll stop here <clears throat> uh, and uh, look forward to, to discussing all, all these issues. Okay. Thank you very much, Marcos. Uh, Diego, do you want to say a few words about sure. your initial remarks? Sure. Thank you, Yuri. I'll, I'll do my best to stay under four to five minutes. I'm not doing my best. I will actually stay <laughs> under four to five minutes, I promise. So it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Great to see Marcos again and to get to know Solvay. Uh, so looking forward to the discussion. And I'll begin by saying that 
it was interesting to notice how in the elections, in the electoral outcome, the country was electorally divided, but not institutionally divided. So as soon as Lula's victory was announced, many key political players and institutions rallied uh, to, even from the Bolsonarista camp, to accept the, the outcome and to treat Lula as the president-elect. And Arthur Lira, the president of the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil, is the clearest example. He had been, um, although sometimes ambiguous, but during the electoral period, he was an ally of Bolsonaro. He was a key player in preventing Bolsonaro from being impeached. If not, uh, he's, he's not a sufficient variable, but it's certainly important in explaining this, this outcome. And so I think this is the interesting starting point for, for the conversation for me, because I think courts were crucial for this, this outcome. And Bolsonaro tried in the last two years to dismantle vertical accountability and electoral checks by claiming that he would only obey the electoral results if if he accepted them, basically, if he, he, he liked the outcome, not accepted them. He won't accept them if he uh, agreed with the outcome. That was, I think, behind his uh, not so subtle dog whistle claims about you know the need for transparent uh, auditing of the electoral results. And he was also very active in trying to undermine horizontal accountability by attacking the Supreme Court. The problem is in Brazil is that those two fronts, they, they intersect because the federal Supreme Court um, is also, uh, um, it's a body that contributes with two to three judges to the Supreme Electoral Court in Brazil. And specifically in this period in 2022, during the electoral period, we have a single judge, Alexandre de Moraes, who was uh, both presiding over proceedings in the Brazilian Supreme Court criminal proceedings that were a key tool in the Supreme Court's array of resources to check Bolsonaro in the last few years. But Alexandre de Moraes was also presiding the electoral uh, superior court, the TSC. So it was very easy for Bolsonaro to attack, you know, to, to focus on specific people as if attacking Judge Moraes is the best way to undermine both his electoral accountability and his horizontal accountability. And, and while these attacks, they had effects, I think they had informal effects, they do leave lasting marks on the court's public standing. We had these protests a few weeks ago, uh, near, nearly vi near violent protests against the, the against Supreme Court judges who were in New York for an, an event. It's, uh, although I think these effects uh, are are there, and they will affect the court's legitimacy. It, it is certainly the case, I would argue, that Bolsonaro was spectacularly unsuccessful in all of his institutional attacks against the court. He could not impeach Supreme Court judges, even though he tried. Uh, he threatened to not, not to obey Supreme Court decisions several times, and he never actually performed such a stunt. So I think it's interesting. I think this is connected to my initial point, which is Bolsonaro, he lost the election, but he had half of the votes. So that's that's a lot of electoral support. But if we look at the broader pattern here, we see that institutionally, the country is also not as divided as it would seem if we look at just uh, uh, the measure of electoral strength. So Bolsonaro uh, had tried for a while to adopt measures against both the electoral judges and the Supreme Court justice, but, but he couldn't. And um, and I think part of this, I'll just leave it here, and then we can proceed to the to the to uh, Solvay. It's that the court was able to build public support and even legislative support in these last few years to to check Bolsonaro. I think even internationally, people tend to focus a lot on the individual person of Judge Moraes, but I think that misses the, the larger picture at stake here. Yes, now his individual decisions, some of them very controversial for sure, uh, and the specific timing of such decisions was very important for this outcome, but if we look at the at all the, the attempts by Bolsonaro to attack him institutionally and even impeach him, and how they failed, and if you look at how Moraes was able to uh, judge and punish even a member of Congress from the Bolsonarista camp, Daniel Silveira, 
in a case in which Congress could have, at several points, could have used many of its clear constitutional powers to protect this person from judicial sanctions, but Congress did not. So Congress drew a line, I think. Congress uh, clearly was not going to impeach Bolsonaro, but also was not going to lend its support to any attacks on the Supreme Court and the TSC. And I could leave okay, several yeah. other examples. Yeah, sure. I will, will interrupt you there. Thank Your you. Thank five you. minutes That's are over, so we can go. Thank you. Thank so you. Bye. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Yuri, and uh, real pressure to be here, and uh, especially to, to Marcus and, and Diego that know so much more about uh, the details of this process than me. Um, and my main focus will be on, on environment and, and climate politics. That's the, the parts that I've studied. So, um, moving a bit away from the institutions and over to the politics of these elections, I think um, for environmentalists, this was uh, no or never uh, decision. Uh, if, if it was really seen as a catastrophic um, option to have Bolsonaro for four more years. And this has to do with all the Amazon tipping points, all these uh, processes uh, uh, of, of acceleration of environmental destruction uh, that were set uh, and, and set in movement by, by Bolsonaro's government. And that was um, also um, sort of trickling over or, or, or yeah, having an, uh, impacts on, on neighboring Amazonian, Amazonian countries. So um, there are many people that were part of the government, of the environmental institutions, of the sort of um, environmental Brazil, climate Brazil, before Bolsonaro, they lost their positions because of the, the turnover in the administrations. And they've used this four years to build uh, a solid community and to keep their community and the, the, the cooperation between researchers, uh, former governmental officials, um, environmental NGOs, people that before Bolsonaro were at quite opposite camps of environmental protection politics, but that now found together and, 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 and have made a strong base. And I was really afraid that if Bolsonaro wins again, then this will disappear, they will lose faith. Uh, so um, in that way, it was sort of a hope um, that everything is not lost. <laughs> Uh, and I think Lula made a lot of promises during the campaign. And I think uh, with the Congress that was elected, it will be very difficult to keep uh, those, um, those promises, at least all of them. Uh, some of the things that I, I, it goes back to the institutions because the institutions that were quite dismantled by, by Bolsonaro was uh, Ibama and also many of the, um, the other agencies that worked under the Ministry of Environment that were moved from the ministry or that were just closed. And of course, all the people working there. So that's the hope that this can maybe be brought back. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you uh, very much for all the initial remarks. So uh, I think I will pose a question and uh, you can uh, jump in. You mentioned a lot of uh, important issues. Uh, but I think, uh, Marcos, I will start with you then. Uh, if you could summarize, you talk exactly about the result that uh, was a, a surprisingly narrow margin, and also uh, the expectations about Bolsonaro's reaction in case of uh, defeat were very high. Could you tell uh, uh, more about uh, how you how have you seen the process? How are uh, like different from other elections or campaign periods we had this time uh, regarding our, our preview and previous elections? Uh, also in terms of, uh, uh, I think now also the, the way people are campaigning in Brazil is like, uh, uh, we, we usually to put a lot of uh, weight on uh, TV and radio, but I think uh, a lot of the action goes on social media also now. So uh, if you could talk about uh, what you see uh, as particular special in this uh, campaign period, uh, a little bit more. Well, um, as I said, and uh, you 
you mentioned it. Uh, I think that there are three uh, different aspects that uh, uh, is worth uh, considering uh, in this election. The first one is the resilience of Bolsonaro, right? Because uh, there is a, a clear anti-incumbent bias in the region. And some, some people argue that not only in the region, elsewhere in, around the globe, we, we also uh, uh, saw that uh, incumbents losing elections uh, in this is irrespective and independent of how bad or good they managed the, uh, the COVID uh, uh, pandemics. Uh, and uh, if you uh, recall uh, the case of Chile uh, is, is an example, right? Uh, uh, Pinera of Chile was, you know, the, the really, the, the success story the, in the region of uh, a, a very efficient uh, uh, vaccine rollout and, and so on. And Pinera was defeated and, and so many others, right? And more recently in Ecuador, a right winger uh, was elected, Lasso, uh, in Uruguay, uh, in the primaries, the PASO in Argentina, the left uh, lost. So what we, we've been seeing is the incumbents losing election, right? So the so-called incumbent advantage uh, has uh, sort of uh, changed sign. Uh, so, uh, and this, is, it, this is, has to do uh, specifically in this year, 2022, this is compounded by the Ukraine war, right? The war led to uh, food inflation, food price inflation, and, and uh, you know, had other consequences, the price of fuel and so on. So uh, it is a, 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 a terrible situation to be uh, governing a country. You, you probably be defeated, but Bolsonaro has almost won. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, there's no, uh, the, just to stress the point, uh, there's no um, uh, left wave or new uh, left turn. Uh, in fact, what we, we've been seeing is the contrary, right? And Bolsonaro, uh, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the left was defeated in the congressional, congressional elections. But uh, Bolsonaro resilience is really something to be explained, right? to be accounted for, because it's, it's really surprising. Uh, but I'll return to that. The, the, the other issue is, is his competitiveness. So not only he resisted, let's say, uh, this, the, the, the negative trends, but the competitiveness. Because as I said before, he uh, trailed uh, Lula by a 20 percent margin. So it was a, a given in, in Brazil for almost a year, the fact that uh, Lula would win. And uh, there are a lot of people of, of factors to be considered, you know, power abuse on the part of Bolsonaro and opportunistic spending, so-called secret budget and so on. But there are some elements that was uh, somehow surprising and might, might uh, explain part of his success, inverted uh, commas, which is his relatively good uh, economic record. Because for three months, uh, we've, we've seen, we saw uh, deflation in Brazil, not inflation. So Bolsonaro insisted in this point and it, it had some effects. Brazil was the only country in, in the world in, in which uh, the prices were falling uh, and he made a point of that and, and so on. And also unemployment was, uh, re was reduced significantly. It was the lowest since uh, 2014, I think. Uh, so uh, this might explain uh, a little bit his success, but there's, uh, uh, a final element that uh, I think is decisive is Lula's rejection. Uh, the country was very polarized and a very significant numbers of, of Brazilians, half of the population rejected Lula, not only the Bolsonaristas, uh, which account to 15% of the population or something, right? 
Uh, and uh, this re rejec rejection is deep seated. And we, we might uh, discuss uh, later uh, the reasons for this uh, is very deep seated rejection of Lula. And this explains a lot uh, Bolsonaro's re uh, resilience. The third aspect, I think, uh, is the, the, as I mentioned, the uh, relatively uh, peaceful transition. So uh, Diego mentioned that Lira, within uh, 20, uh, 45 minutes after the election result was announced by the Superior Electoral uh, Court, uh, Lira uh, read a, uh, an announcement on, on TV uh, conceding uh, Lira was the president of the Chamber of Deputies and, and somehow uh, in, in, in some ways uh, Bolsonaro's right hand, right? Uh, in the, in the les legislative branch. And he conceded and said that he was prepared to work with the new government. And in the following morning, uh, General Mourão, the vice president, uh, said that he would welcome the new vice president-elect Alckmin uh, for a tour of the Jaburu Palace where, where vice presidents uh, 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 live. Uh, in, in, in Brasilia. So it was uh, uh, smooth. And Bolsonaro, after uh, 44, 48 hours, also uh, instructed his chief of staff uh, to say that uh, he was expecting to be contacted by uh, the president elect's uh, uh, head of uh, protocol and stuff like that to initiate the transition process. So, there was no resistance. And uh, you think the overwhelming majority of people in Brazil would uh, 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 not would claimed in the past, in the recent past, that there would be resistance, that Bo Bolsonaro uh, would not uh, concede uh, defeat. And, uh, and also that the armed forces would, would, would intervene. Uh, but in fact, uh, there were no other than some narratives, uh, there were no evi hard evidence of, for any of these uh, uh, claims, uh, either comparative, historical, or uh, so. This is my my uh, a point that uh, we could uh, uh, deepen uh, uh, looking in the in, in in detail so these three factors are, are really uh worth considering and, and you mentioned uh specifically this last one as something that we should uh uh look at and uh, uh i think there is now an emerging consensus that the threats to democracy were exaggerated and there's a new wave of research there are two papers, new papers by Kurt Weilen from the University of Texas, also from Jason Brownlee in the latest uh, democracy. And uh, they are entitled, if not similarly, but small varieties, uh, why, uh, why democracy uh, survive in some places, but not in others. So what people are doing is explaining the defeat of liberal populists. And there is a... <clears throat> There is a, a concept that is it's used by Tom Ginsburg from the University of Chicago, which I think is very interesting. And it comes from his comparative analysis of the COVID, uh, COVID uh, uh, it, around the world. And uh, to what extent it, it uh, because uh, it was an emergency, uh, it could uh, easily be, be utilized for, uh, uh, manipulation and, and autocratization. Uh, and he says that we only saw, uh, that's what he, he claims, um, we only saw uh, autocratization where there, where there were uh, institutional uh, morbidities, uh, comorbidities, right? Uh, and I think that this applies to, uh, to the discussion of threats to democracy because 
uh, democracy really collapsed only where it never had uh, robust roots. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't expect uh, Nicaragua to survive in, 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 in Nicaragua, uh, democracy to survive in Nicaragua. Uh, or, or be surprised, but uh, some reversal uh, in, in the Philippines and, and or, or in other uh, in, in Turkey and so on uh, countries, or even Hungary and Poland, which for eighty percent of of the or, or more than that, of, if you take the the twenty century as a whole, which never experienced democracy, so uh, the roots are shallow. So we should be. Surprised by the opposite. Why is it that uh, these countries uh, has become uh, democracies and, and and so on and so forth? Okay, now, Marcos, I think I will stop you there. I gave you like some more minutes because you used very few of your uh, initial remarks, but uh, I think you you just raise a, a very good segue uh, for my question to Diego, because. Uh, uh, a lot of people outside Brazil haven't followed so closely uh, the process, but uh, during the election period, the, the TSC, like the elect electoral court, uh, was very active and important in the during this campaign. And also the figure that you mentioned uh, of Alexandre de Moraes, that was the judge presiding the, the court. Uh, for people that haven't followed very closely the process, could you Explain a little bit what was the role of the electoral court, like uh, and the role of uh, uh, Judge Alexandre de Moraes during this uh, process. If you can right use here. like a, a few minutes to explain. Okay, <laughs> very a long very period. briefly then. <laughs> so two parts. First, there is the non-exceptional part of what happened. So in part, the TSC in Brazil has for decades now combined several different roles, which might seem surprising to outsiders, but it's an institution that is not, a, it's not a, exactly a court. The, the electoral courts in Brazil, they fulfill, they, they are structured like courts, but they have powers that go way beyond judicial decision-making. So they, they enact rules for elections, they detail rules enacted by Congress, they police elections, they organize elections, they audit the, 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 the whole process, so they play on several different fronts to make elections happen in a safe uh, way. And, and the TSC has done this for a while. So when people get surprised that uh, Alexandre de Moraes has ordered um, some content to be removed from, from a political ad, for example, because it's uh, negative propaganda against another candidate, there's nothing new per se in, in, in this. This is something that electoral courts in Brazil have been doing for a while. And, and the TSC includes two judges from the Supreme Court, three judges actually, and, and the president, and the president appoints other, I, I won't get into detail about the appointment mechanism, but the point is it's part Supreme Court, part other appointees from the judicial branch and by the president himself. And the TSC was crucial in this election. Here's, here comes the exceptional part, the novelty, right? It's this information, I think. It's the, the TSC has been the main battlefront for this information, for fighting this information in Brazil, which we are not sure of the effects yet on uh, on voting. I won't get into the details, but considering that this was an important part of Bolsonaro's campaign in 2018, whatever the effects, Bolsonaro was trying to do the same again, right? So, and the TSC, one thing to understand about the TSC is that uh, it's a, a slow mover on the outcomes of elections, which also decides if there is a cause for avoiding an election, if somebody use illegal means to get elected. People usually uh, argue at the TSC that the election should be canceled. But this has rarely happened with state governors in the past, has never happened with a president. And there was little reason to believe that the TSC would cancel Bolsonaro's election if he had been elected. That would be politically impossible, although legally correct, not, not legally correct the specific decision, but the competence. It's, it's uncontroversial that the TSC could, in principle, cancel an election if there is sufficient cause considering abuse of economic power, of political power, of communicative power. So what, what, so that TSC is a slow mover on these outcomes. It takes years to decide on such challenges. So it has to do other things to prevent the worst outcomes. So it interferes a lot and very quickly on the procedures as the election is happening. So we had lots of usual decisions removing content 
uh, granting uh, the right to answer in, in online social platform to, to the, there was a controversial decision that granted resposta, right, the right to answer uh, in online venues to, to the workers party. But two things about this exceptional part, and then I, I will conclude. So um, first it has done also uh, its fair share of controversial decisions involving the workers party as well. So there was, it's just that Bo Bolsonaro's uh, number of uh, engagement with this potential disinformation instances was much, much more significant. And the second thing is that the TSC had already, was already entered the elections carrying a loaded gun because last year it voided the election in 2018. So for almost four years after the election, it said that the state, a member of the state assembly of Paraná, Deputy Franceschini, his election should be voided because he spread disinformation on uh, and fake claims of electoral fraud on election day. So this was unprecedented, uh, saying that somebody somebody's election was void because of this information or spreading false claims about uh, the electoral the, the electronic booths, and the Supreme Court, the electoral court actually had already placed this loaded gun on the table, so to speak. So it was saying, you know, I can do this. I did it with uh, a state representative. I might do it uh, the equivalent thing even with the president. However, as I said, and here I will conclude. Legally possible, politically extremely unlikely that the TSC would, no matter what Bolsonaro did during the elections, I think it would be very hard to for the TSC to cancel his election on whatever grounds, politically speaking. No, uh, thank you, Diego. I think it's uh, interesting because uh, uh, it uh, sort of uh, makes a, a link to the point of uh, Marcos because uh, I think the Supreme Court, the Electoral Court in Brazil played an important role also of, uh, and has been playing an important role in sort of securing <laughs> democracy uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, but let's uh, move to, to Sulvai uh, because Sulvai, you, you mentioned exactly about the high expectations uh, of Lula among uh, environmental groups, activists, indigenous people, etc. Uh, and uh, I think uh, what we've seen is that uh, the environmental aspects or topic was not very much discussed in Brazil itself during the election time, but a lot uh, outside Brazil. Uh, and also, uh, and then I, I would like you to, to give us a perspective about uh, how the international community was uh, uh, seeing this uh, election from uh, this uh, uh, about uh, uh, this issue, and also uh, exactly how you've seen now that Lula won, uh, what uh, he's doing to uh, sort of uh, fulfill these expectations. Well, I think, first of all, to people outside Brazil, this was mainly a presidential election. So the whole con election of Congress, of the governors, it sort of passes under the radar. Uh, and um, so I get when when Lula won, I got on the question. So what happens now? What will he do? And it's okay. He needs to form a majority in the Congress and all these kind of boring issues that they're not so interested in. So they what happens to the rainforest? But um, I think it's important to look at these other issues as well because it was not only Lula that was elected. It was a lot of new governors in the Amazonian states, and uh, many of them were pro Bolsonaro, and um, this, of course, you must correct me if I'm wrong on this, but to me, Brazilian politicians has have always seemed uh, quite pragmatic compared to in some other countries. So my hope was that these, once Lula is elected, they will sort of turn to work with power instead of working against it. That's my my hope for this. Um, it leaves a bit of hope for, for the Amazon still, but I think um, why it gets attention uh, so much, I think, uh, Brazil is an environmental power. Uh, Brazil would like to be an international global power in many aspects, but on the environment, it is. And it's obvious to most people uh, working with climate and environment that if Brazil can't do it, if Brazil can't preserve biodiversity, avoid um, or at least lower the rates of deforestation, then who can do it? Can Congo do it? Can Indonesia do it? So I'm sorry. That's the 
that's the hope that was put on Lula. And that's why we see so much attention. And then it was the COP issue. Um, and the hope that maybe Marina Silva comes back in the government and and sort of a hope of a repetition of what happened 20 years ago. And then the situation is different now. Um, but I think Lula was seen in last time he was the president, he was seen as sort of a mediator between the global north and south. So he went to the um, to these Davos uh, World Economic Forums. He did a good good place. He said he's a good global politician, and he likes to be in the global uh, limelight. Um, so, um, in a in a world that's becoming more and more unpredictable, uh, Lula is sort of a okay. We know what we, we will get. We will get someone that we can talk to. We will get someone that that understands global politics. And so it was surprising to many when he was uh, ambiguous on the Russia-Ukraine issue that he has um, many agendas internationally. There's a, there's a different role of China this time. There's a different role of the US. So it's not given that he will go back to the same role. Uh, but I think on, on the environmental issues, um, the fact that he came to the COP, the fact that he presented a lot of promises um, he will at least play the game. He will he will be part of of, of trying to do something. And what I think uh, was a bit hopeful with his presentation from an environmental perspective, maybe not from the like liberal global agenda perspective, but from a from a climate perspective, was that he reached out the hand to Indonesia, to Congo, and maybe he can do the same for the Amazon for to with with Colombia. Uh, he even there was talk that he would cooperate with Maduro, with Venezuela, which I think it's a more difficult, but but that he can play this sort of um, yeah mediator role or, or cooperation role for an international environment that that it's really needed because it's it's not really um, there's there's no one in that role currently. The EU wants to take it, but it hasn't really been able to in the way that they want to. But I think the hope for many is that, that Lula can be this sort of bridge binder between the global south and north again, uh, which remains to be seen. And it will, of course, depend a lot on what kind of, um, on what happens in Brazil, what's in his home court to solve and to sort out. That will have a lot to say on the role that he can take internationally, yeah, I think. So, um, uh, yeah, and then, of course, the the Congress, as as many mentioned, it, it's not left leaning at all, and it's it's uh, even further to the right than and what's been uh, before, and and the rural caucus is even stronger. So it will be a difficult battle uh, at home as well if if he wants to do something on the environment. I think um, something that can be done is to restore the institutions, the environmental institutions, and also. Um, get a bit further on illegal deforestation uh, and on law enforcement, uh, which has been, uh, um, yeah, not very high on the priority list of, of the Bolsonaro government. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Suvai. Uh, I'll back to Marcus now uh, and also introducing a little bit more going towards our second uh, topic that is actually now the, the transition uh so marcus you mentioned exactly like the how uh in the end how uh sort of polarized in some sense the country was because of this uh uh the huge rejection that uh you identified uh, against lula and the workers party uh so my, my main question is that uh, is this sort of polarization rejection do you think that will now that we see a very active already negotiation with Congress by the elected president Lula. Uh, are we going to see also this polarization in the institutions or in the negotiations with Congress? Do you think there will be uh, a sort of a very polarized institutional relations between uh, the new president and uh, the legislative? Uh, or are we going to uh, go back to sort of a more normal uh, relationship between 
the president and the and Congress? Well, I think that's the the key to understand what's going to happen, uh, because uh, uh, despite the fact that Lula uh, won the presidency, uh, he his party, uh, in large party now with uh, two smaller uh, parties, the Communist Party and the uh, Green Party, uh, they account only for 13 percent of the seats in Congress, 13. Uh, if we uh, include the electoral coalition, uh, which involves uh, other uh, left parties, uh, it, it jumps to 23%. So uh, we, we see that the situation of Lula is unprecedented, despite the fact that in the past, the, the worker party has never had uh, under Lula or Dilma more than 20% of the vote. Uh, the situation was not as polarized, but uh, at, at the same time, some uh, center left and center parties could, uh, uh, they were closer to, to Lula. And he managed to, uh, to build <clears throat> oversized and highly heterogeneous uh, coalitions. I think this is unlikely now, but uh, the, the, the situation now uh, is, is very uh, peculiar. Where, where does this, uh, this come from? Let me just give you uh, some uh, concrete examples so, so that the, the people in the audience can uh, uh, understand what's going on. Uh, Lula is from Pernambuco, right? So he has this bonus of the uh, the home vote, uh, people vote for somebody who is from that state. Uh, he got here, as well as in the neighbor state of Paraíba, uh, 70, roughly 70% 70 of the vote, right? And the state delegation uh, to, to, in Congress from the state of Pernambuco has 25 representatives. The uh, workers' parties managed to elect one single uh, federal deputy out of 25. But at the same time, Lula uh, caught 70% of, of, of the vote. The situation is very similar in Paraíba. In, in Sergipe, uh, uh, not only uh, the, the workers' parties elected uh, none, and, and the left, uh, the non-workers' parties left elected zero as well. So all the federal uh, deputies comes from uh, the two uh, major uh, uh, parties that support Bolsonaro, PP and PL, the PL and the PP. Uh, so this, this divorce uh, between the, the Legislative vote and the executive vote explains a lot of, uh, of the dynamics now. So somehow uh, uh, Lula uh, can count with a very small uh, uh, share of votes uh, in, in, the, in, in the chamber. So it would be difficult or impossible to, uh, to approve a single piece of legislation by up by uh, uh, absolute majority in the Chamber of Deputies and uh, would be absolutely impossible uh, to, to reach the constitutional quorum if it doesn't include uh, the, the core of the opposition, which is the PL and the Republicans, right? So the more malleable uh, uh, Bolsonarista party, which is the PP, uh, uh, which, whose president is now the president of the Chamber of Deputies uh, and, and is a key player now in the transition, uh, Arthur Lira, he, uh, he has uh, enormous power and veto power over a lot of things. So in, in a way, uh, there, are, there are two options, uh, theoretically speaking, right? One is the Allende type of uh, uh, strategy, right? In, uh, uh, enshrined in that uh, 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 motto by Carlos Altamirano, uh, avançar sem transar. In other words, 
go for it and tries in a Caesaristic uh, way uh, impose its agenda, it would be a total disaster. But this, but this, op this option is only theoretical, right? It's entirely out of the picture. Uh, so Lula has to transar, uh, has to negotiate, and that's what he's been doing, and he's good at, good at it. But uh, in a way, he is in the hands of uh, of uh, these part party leaders that hold the the uh, all, all the pull all the strings in Congress and 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 and, and so on. Um, in order to uh, to approve uh, constitutional amendments, and Brazil is a peculiar country because everything is constitutionalized and. Uh, very often you need to, to uh, resort to, to changing the constitution in order to change policy, which is uh, somehow bizarre. Uh, you know, there's this, uh, this, this uh, difficulty in, in approving things resulting from this, uh, this system where, where everything is constitutionalized and very difficult to change. Uh, there, there are veto uh, gates and players in in in, in built in the in the system but we, um yeah. no yeah. We, we come back to that uh marcus uh, okay to the to these uh, difficulties but i i was going uh to ask uh, diego exactly about um uh sort of coming back to normalization of the uh relationships between powers because uh, during bolsonaro government we had a lot of uh, frictions also between the presidency and the courts, especially the Supreme Court. Uh, but coming back uh, and then to this point, like uh, uh, how do you see now first, actually just a point there uh, about the electoral court is that uh, uh, actually after the elections, uh, for those that haven't been follow uh, so much Brazil, they're coming up uh, sort of uh, fraud accusations, even like a, a official complaints about uh, frauds uh, for the electoral court that were uh, made by the uh, PLS president, uh, the Bolsonaro's party. Uh, so, and the, and the court had an answer to it, but uh, there has been also some like uh, noise made by uh, Bolsonaro about this, uh, at least the Bolsonaro front about this topic. Could you talk a, lo a little bit about that? And then uh, also about the expectations of between uh, Lula and uh, the Supreme Court? Do you think there will be a more like a normal as uh, before or also troublesome as uh, during Bolsonaro? Okay, that's a lot to unpack, but I'll, I'll do my best. So uh, regarding the first question, yeah, Bolsonaro has been claiming that there were frauds since 2018, right? He said that there were frauds even in the election in which he won. <laughs> so uh, so he claimed that if it were not for frauds, he would have been elected in the first round, 2018. And he has kept this as his favorite claim. He never stopped saying that. There were moments where he would stay more or less quiet for a while, but this was one of his favorite talking points. And and I think the, 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 the effect on, on the electoral system, on the courts, I think maybe, maybe I will have a different perspective than Marcus here. Um, yes, he did not succeed, but he's building support. He's building support for a movement that in a few years might make it much less costly to simply refuse to accept an electoral result, directly challenge an electoral court decision or Supreme Court decision. So I think especially if he had won, if he had won, then perhaps you would see a different path. But, but so uh, Brazilians then were... Um, dozens of thousands of Brazilians spread in many cities in the country were uh, rallying to the streets and blocking roads, blocking highways, uh, uh, um, waiting for Bolsonaro to do something, to redeem his promises of not accepting the results if, if they were not, uh, if it was not a clear, clean, clean cut, uh, transparent victory. And then you, you see a succession of uh, uh, half-baked attempts by different groups in the military, and then even Bolsonaro's political party, the PL, clearly trying to please him, I think. It was something that they, they, they owed Bolsonaro, I guess. And showing these allegations that were completely ridiculous, uh, unbased, and had been debunked several times. 
which is very different from saying that the system can be reformed. It's, they were claiming that there were actual enough, um, there, there was enough, they, they couldn't prove there was a fraud, but it was enough to say that the electoral court should void uh, millions of votes. They, 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 they asked the electoral court, the PL, Bolsonaro's party, to void votes. And, and the electoral court, here, Moraes has done something that was an individual decision, and it was a bold move, and it's controversial. He applied a heavy fine to the party, uh, to any something million reais, which is a substantial share of the party's uh, budget. And then he said that this is something that in Brazilian law should be considered uh, bad faith litigation.